Back to 1 Corinthians. 1 Corinthians 1.11 says, For I have been informed concerning you, my brethren, by Chloe's people, that there are quarrels among you. And these quarrels and divisions are relative to whom one is to give allegiance. 1 Corinthians 1.12 Now I mean this, that each one of you is saying, I am of Paul, and I of Apollos, and I of Cephas, and I of Christ. <clears throat> so, the division is not as some objectors say over an argument over some biblical truth, like I had the argument last Saturday and yesterday, but over to whom believers are to give allegiance, a false doctrine, when it is other than our Lord Jesus Christ himself. 1 Corinthians 1.13, has Christ been divided? Has he? <clears throat> Paul was not crucified for you, was he? Or were you baptized in the name of Paul? Paul answers that just in case. I thank God that I baptized none of you except Crispus and Gaius. Oh, so that no one would say that you were baptized in my name. But he goes on about this. So the divisions were not over contending for the truth of God's word, which we are to do. But over whom these believers held allegiance to. <clears throat> Unbiblical matters. That some held allegiance to others apart from Jesus Christ in some manner. And Paul's answer in this matter was that one's allegiance is to be to Christ and Christ alone. No exceptions. <clears throat> A divisive statement coming out of the mouth of the Apostle Paul. Right? He's being divisive. But about the truth. He's on the side of the truth. Notice that Paul's statement, I thank God that I baptized none of you except Crispus and Gaius so that no one would say you were baptized in my name, implies that water baptism, which is in view, here is not part of what one must do to be saved unto eternal life. For, for Paul evidently did not consider it essential for that purpose. <clears throat> of course, by reading Paul and other key points in, the, in Scripture, and everywhere really, I know what to argue and what not. Argue what God said. Don't have to decide whether I think it's true or not. I've determined it is true. I don't have to decide something out of the side of the Bible is true or not. I just go to the Bible and get God's answer. Don't answer of your own. Answer from God. Look at 1 Timothy 6, 3-9. Relative to divisions within the church. <clears throat> I say, consider another passage. This one located in 1 Timothy 6, 3-9. In which verse 4 is pulled out of context and falsely cited to condemn the active and faithful Christian who testifies in public. That's what I got severely castigated Saturday about arguing. Well, here is Paul arguing. And then in, Paul says in 1 Timothy 6, 4, he, it is falsely maintained, who testifies in public of the doctrine of eternal life is conceited. He understands nothing. But he has a morbid interest in controversial questions and disputes about words out of which arise envy, strife, abusive language, and evil suspicions. You take that out of its context, and I say, but isolation of one verse apart from the context does not do God's word justice. I have never seen it do God's word justice by taking it out of the context. Consider the rest of the passage, which speaks of an entirely different subject, as it begins in verse 3, <clears throat> not verse 4. If anyone advocates a different doctrine and does not agree with sound words from Scripture, those of our Lord Jesus Christ in Scripture, and with a doctrine confirming to God, conforming to godliness, notice that the subject of the passage is those who espouse false doctrine, not those who argue for the truth of the gospel, the words of our Lord, and stand firm in doing so. <clears throat> so, move on to verse 4, which we quoted out of context. I love it when this machine does this. He, verse 4, who teaches such false doctrine as verse 3 we just talked about. Teach a false gospel. You know what? I'm going to argue. Is conceited and understands nothing. But he who has a morbid interest in, our, in controversial questions and disputes about words out of which arise envy, strife, 
abuse, language, evil, suspicions. So was I arguing properly Saturday about what the gospel was? It's not about demonstrating your faith in order to prove that you're saved. Because I can't do that. You don't know whether I'm reliable or not. I could be faking it. I say I go to church all the time. Don't say any swear words. And say the, uh, uh, make Jesus the Lord of your life. Where is that in the Bible? That you have to not say swear words and, and be a, a, a very good person behaving right. And that makes you say, no, faith alone and Christ alone. And I argued for that. And constant friction between men of depraved mind and depraved, deprived of the truth. See, I was arguing Saturday with people who weren't talking what was in the Bible. Who supposed that godliness is a means of gain? Yes, you see, they think the gain of salvation is doing by your faithful works. No, you've got the eternal life gift of gain of salvation by faith alone. Who supposed that godliness is a means of gain? That passage refers to those who teach that being prosperous is a reflection of one's godliness. Oh, so the mafia are great godly people, huh? It does not refer to believers who stand firm in the defense of the gospel. This passage goes on to teach that being content with what one has is the issue and not striving to get God to make them prosperous or condemning other faithful believers who are not materially successful for their supposed lack of godliness. Define, redefine godliness as you go along to get along. Go along with what the pastor of a particular church teaches you. Uh, don't defend what you know the Bible says. Go along with what they say because you won't be kicked out of the congregation. I've seen the back door of a number of churches. Go leave out of the back door, not the front. One time I was asked to go through the front door. I thought, wow, okay. I was surrounded by six deacons. They walked me out the parking lot and said, go across the street, never come back again. I said, what did I do wrong? Are oh, you talking to other people about the gospel. Well, what was I saying that was wrong? I said, believe in Jesus. Is that not right? One guy said, yeah, I think you're right. Well, then why are you just because I'm going with everybody else? Why are you kicking me out? He tended to believe me. I wonder if they, uh, they kicked him out too. <coughs> Goes on to 1 Timothy 6, 6. But godliness actually is a means of great gain. When accompanied by contentment, be happy with the contentment. Paul goes on to say that it is not riches which reflect a believer's godliness, but his contentment with whatever is his situation. For we have brought nothing into the world, so we cannot take anything out of it either. See, they didn't bother reading the whole passage. And if we have food and covering, with these we shall be content, which I do. But those who want to get rich fall into temptation and a snare and many foolish and harmful desires which plunge men into ruin and destruction. So the very things they condemned me for for being argumentative about the gospel they themselves had a false gospel so those who advocate the false doctrine of being guaranteed riches as a result of so-called godly behavior will fall into eventual ruin and destruction not those who truly argue for the actual truths of god's word furthermore contending for the face is actually a scriptural truth and a command to every believer take a look at jude 3 and 4 Chapter 1, there's only one chapter. And Philippians 1, 27 to 28. Since I just argued that Saturday, let's look at it. Jude 3 and 4. Verses 3 and 4 in Jude. <clears throat> Beloved, while I was making every effort to write to you about our common salvation, I felt the necessity to write to you, appealing that you contend. What's contend mean? Argue. Substitute the word. Synonymous. Argue. Contend earnestly for the faith which was once for all handed down to the saints. Some people accuse Jesus of arguing. Yes, he was contentious. Well, what did he argue? Nothing but the truth. Take a look at Matthew 31. Boy, he nailed the Pharisees to the wall with that. Now, verse 4, Jude 1, chapter 1, verse 4. For certain persons have crept in unnoticed. Aha, those who were long beforehand marked out for this condemnation, ungodly persons who turned the grace of our God See, they turn the grace of salvation into eternal life, into works, into licentiousness, and deny our only Master and Lord Jesus Christ. And they go ahead and, and uh, lead licentious lives. The other ones that you argue against. <clears throat> Not me, I'm arguing for the doctrines of the faith. Show me where I'm wrong, I will say. 
Show me Romans. Go to the Bible verse. Give me chapter and verse. They won't, don't want to do that. Philippians 1, 27 to 28. His repetition. <clears throat> Philippians 1, 27 to 28. What does Paul say there? Jude said there, what he said, let's see what Paul says, only to conduct yourself in a manner worthy of the gospel of Christ, so that whether I, whether I come and see you or remain absent, I will hear of you that you are standing firm in one spirit, with one mind, striving together for the faith of the gospel. Striving means you're arguing. What do you do when you stand firm for the gospel? You don't punch. You argue with your mouth. You don't wear a fine suit of clothes and say, I, I must be saved. Look at this clothing I'm wearing, my new hairdo. In no way alarmed by your opponents. See, opponents arguing, which is a sign of destruction for them, but of salvation for you, and that too from God. Salvation comes through Christ. For to you it has been granted for Christ's sake not only to believe in him, then say believe in babe, or get prosperous, but also to suffer for him for his sake. Usually it's a lot to do with rejection, sometimes physical, I've had some physical done, uh, and isolation, being kicked out of church is no fun, uh, people spitting in your face, throttling you with your hands, with their hands, a lot, a lot can happen that's worse than that. Compare Titus 3, 4 to 10, relative to divisions within the church. But when the kindness and love of God, our Savior, appeared, he saved us not because of righteous things we had done, but because of his mercy. He saved us through the washing of rebirth and renewal by the Holy Spirit, whom he poured out on us generously through Jesus Christ, our Savior, so that having been justified by his grace, we might become heirs, having the hope of eternal life. Grace means you did nothing. <clears throat> this is a trustworthy saying, and I want to stress these things so that those who have trusted in God may be careful to devote themselves to doing what is good. These things are excellent and profitable for everyone. Now here's the problem. It says to avoid foolish controversies and genealogies. Was I doing that when I was arguing by grace through faith and that you're not of yourselves, gift of God, not by works, lest any man should boast? Is that controversial? It is a lot. The Lordship Salvation is. And was I talking about genealogies there in Ephesians 2, 8, 9? No. And arguments and quarrels about the law. Was I arguing about the law? They were arguing that I should perform faithful things. And they even mentioned the Ten Commandments. Because they didn't know that there were more than Ten Commandments. Talk about somebody that is ignorant of the Bible. Guy was preaching, keep the Ten Commandments and you'll make it into heaven. <clears throat> These three arguments are unprofitable and useless. And yet they thought they were profitable. One of the guys came up and assaulted me earlier. Warned a divisive person once, and then warned him a second time. From that party, they warned me about divisiveness. After that, have nothing to do with him. So what they finally did is they walked away from me. But two stuck with me for about an hour. And we shook hands, and I told them about the website that they can get information about, and maybe we can have a conversation. Verse 11. You may be sure that such a man is warped and sinful, he is self-condemned. Notice that there is a kind of argument which is based on unscriptural reasoning, which is therefore divisive since they are over matters which are not part of or cannot be proved by scripture, and thus foolish and unprofitable. I kept telling them, show me chapter and verse where I'm wrong. The guy said, Christ only died for those who are going to be saved. I said, what does it say? For he is the propitiation of Jesus Christ for our sins, believers, and not for ours only, but the sins of the whole world. They looked at me in silence. The guy was maintaining Christ only died for the elect. Wouldn't answer. Then went away, and then the guy that assaulted me came up, went right up to my face, expecting me to do something. Wow. Why didn't you answer the 1 John 2, 2? I said, go read it. Tell me I'm wrong. I'm willing to be proved wrong. All he gave me was his big, fat stomach. Notice that there was a kind of argument which is based on unscriptural reasoning, and that's the one I got last Saturday. Well, let's look on. Compare Romans 16, 17, 18 relative to divisions within the church. So Paul in the first Corinthians is not talking about these kinds of divisions. I urge you brothers to watch out for those who cause divisions and put obstacles in your way that are contrary to the teaching you have learned. Keep away from them. 
contrary to the teaching you have learned. I said, 1 John 2, 2. 